for the past 50 years, the community has grown from strength to strength and has brought solutions to growers, processors, traders, and consumers. If you have noticed, today is a very special date. It is 2 slash 22 slash 22. And uh, numerologists state that this is a very special date. It's an angel's date. It comes once in a lifetime. Uh, astrologers say that this is a day that brings special energy to connect. And with this note, I would like to invite our executive director, uh, Ms. Firna Mazuki, to please uh, present the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Jaswinder, our moderator for the IPC webinar series one to 20, 2022. Uh, Ms. Laura Shumo, uh, Executive Director, American Spice Trade Association, ASTA. Uh, Mr. Rao, Vice President Operation, Griffith Food, Foods Incorporated. My dearest international pepper community family and ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening from Jakarta, natural beauty of the metropolitan city. On behalf of the International Pepper Community Secretariat, it is with great honor that I welcome you to the first series of IPC webinar for 2022 with the theme Sustainability of the Paper Industry Aligning with the New Normal. I would like to sincerely express my utmost gratitude and appreciation to all of you for having spent time from your busy schedule to participate in the IPC webinar. Before I proceed, please allow me to introduce myself briefly. My name is Firna Azura Ikaputri Marzuki from Malaysia, the new executive director of the International Paper Community. I've been appointed in May, replacing uh, my successor, Ms. Uh, Huang Tilian from Vietnam, which is based on three years uh, rotation basis. Before joining IPC, I was with the Ministry of Plantation Industries and Commodities, Malaysia, and I've been involved with the development of the uh, global pepper industry in general and pepper industry in Malaysia, specifically during my service as the governor official. Today, we are meeting in a vir virtual posture or a digital platform in light of the COVID-19 pandemic we face as a global community. The latest variant Omicron possessing a higher risk of reinfection and has led to resurgence of increased infection cases in many countries and has been reported from at least 23 countries with most cases reported from the Africa and Europe country. Needless to say, this pandemic has significantly changed everything, the way we live, the way we socialize, and the way we work. It is very encouraging to see how, even in the midst of these challenging times during the, the pandemic, we are here meeting virtually to discuss and share insights on the development of the global paper industry. Ladies and gentlemen, 2022 is set to be another challenging, encouraging and exciting year for the pepper industry despite the global pandemic. With the pandemic came lockdowns, travel bans and quarantine. These have been affected the pepper industry as much as it has any other sectors. Inflation putting pressure on cost of pepper farming, rising freight rates and inability to provide farm extension have impacted the industry adversely. Not just the pandemic, but other issues such as climate change, stringent regulations for pepper trade, and price volatility are some of the key challenges we are facing today in the pepper industry. In this regard, the first series of IPC webinar therefore was designed with the team sustainability of the pepper industry aligning with the new normal. Today, we have invited distinguished speakers to briefly talk about various challenges and mitigation options that are available for the pepper industry. To kick off the session later, we have Mr. Rao, Vice President of Terova Foods, a subsidiary of the Griffith Foods Incorporated, who will be speaking on the supply chain aspects of the business. After that, we have Ms. Laura Shumo, the Executive Director of the American Spice Trade Association, or ASTA, will take us through the new regulations for the paper trade in the United States. After that, the global supply and demand will be presented by Mr. Jaswinder, our consultant and economist for IPC. And finally, I'll be speaking on the latest development, issues and challenges, opportunities, and way forward for the pepper industry at the end of the presentations. There will be a Q&A session and a panel discussion as well. Ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned by Jaswinder earlier, uh, this year marks uh, 50th anniversary of the establishment of IPC. 
the IPC is committed to ensure that the global paper industry will remain sustainable and competitive. This is in particular in its role in promoting and coordinating the development of paper industry, which are much needed as we shift gears in the battle against COVID-19. With countries beginning to ease restrictions and reopen most of the economic sectors towards ensuring the sustainable development of the industry and the welfare of the paper smallholders. We look forward to working on the many initiatives to deliver the best for IPC and the industry. Depending on the global scenario, we look forward to reviving the paper industry by first half of 2022. And in the interim, the focus will be more on post-pandemic plan for the paper industry in ensuring its sustainability. There are three main pillars for the recovery of the paper industry and creative economy, namely innov innovation, adaptation, and collaboration. As, great nation, as a great nation, we need to collaborate with others and we should not enjoy too much on competition and we should not forget innovation by utilizing digital technology and adapt amid the pandemic by putting forward the health protocol strictly and well-controlled manner. We will work together with all IPC member countries and paper stakeholders to provide work plan or strategies on how to tackle the farmer needs in the post-COVID-19 phase, how the industry stays agile beyond this crisis and how to ensure the sustainability of the paper industry in the long run in order to ensure the paper smallholders to maintain their existing farms and increase the incomes. Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, as much as we are all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic is a global shock like no other involving real-time disruption, disruptions to both supply and demands in an interconnected world economy, including the paper industry. And I always believe that two heads are better than one. And as such, it is with our high hope that all paper industry stakeholders will work together hand in hand and strengthen our networking and cooperation for the betterment of the paper industry, particularly during these trying times. Once again, on behalf of the IPC Secretariat, I would like to sincerely express my utmost gratitude and appreciation to all of you, especially to our distinguished speakers, Ms. Laura and Mr. Rao, having spent time from your busy schedule to participate and contribute to the first series of IPC webinar for this year. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank AIM Energy Saving Technology uh, Limited, a paper drying machine manufacturer from Guangdong, China, as our main sponsor for the first series of IPC webinar. On that note, I wish all of you a very productive and informative webinar. Thank you. Back to you, Jasmine. There. Without taking much time, I would uh, uh, request Mr. Rao to start his presentation on uh, aligning with the new normal for the value addition sector. Thank you, uh, Jasinder, and uh, uh, also Firna for the uh, wonderful introduction uh, of today's uh, session. And I also welcome all the participants and the panelists to this uh, session. Um, I, I am going to speak uh, uh, a little bit on uh, how to adopt to the new norm. Uh, you heard the opening, uh, uh, you know, uh, speeches by both. Jaswinder and Firna, they talked about this. And uh, I will uh, take the easy path of uh, sharing what uh, we have done uh, to uh, you know, counter the effects of uh, uh, the uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, I hope that will uh, be more practical uh, than uh, trying to present what uh, overall the industry is doing. So let me uh, move ahead. Uh, very briefly uh, to introduce Griffith Foods uh, to uh, some of you, because some of, most of you are aware of this. Uh, Griffith Foods is um, uh, over a hundred year old company uh, headquartered in uh, Chicago in the US. And uh, it operates uh, today in more than 20 countries. Uh, Griffith Foods makes uh, products, uh, B2B products for the food industry. Uh, some of the key products that we make are sauces, gravies, protein seasonings, snack seasonings, flavors, bases, and uh, uh, other functional blends. Uh, and uh, our products can be found in uh, 
most of the top brands uh, uh, across the world. Uh, as you may have guessed, you know, spices and herbs uh, is one of the key uh, raw materials that we source. Uh, and the Terova has the key role to play. Terova, uh, Terova is a 100% subsidiary of Griffith Foods, and uh, it has the task of uh, sustainably sourcing spices and herbs, uh, and uh, also to uh, make these uh, products available to uh, other uh, players who are outside the Griffith world. So this is basically uh, a brief about us and uh, our connection with spices. Uh, we are uh, have been sourcing spices and herbs now for almost 80 to 90 years. And uh, some of our key raw materials are black pepper, of course, chili, paprika, sage, and, and white pepper as well. Uh, so oregano, celery, these are all minor ones. But as you can see, black and white pepper are very, very important to us and uh, uh, forms almost 30-35% uh, of our spend on this category. So uh, let me start by uh, you know, stating some of the key concerns or challenges that we are facing as an industry today. Uh, this relates not only to pepper, uh, but all, to the entire spice industry. So uh, from the point of view of somebody who is sourcing and uh, processing and marketing the products. So first is the regulatory compliance. This is changing day by day, and it is getting tightened uh, by most of the uh, importing countries. Recently, uh, you know, we heard that chlorophyllifos has become a big issue in the US, and I'm sure Laura will be covering more on this, but uh, it suffices to note that uh, we are facing, uh, you know, uh, tightened uh, regulations, and these regulations are getting more and more stringent day by day. Second is, of course, the scarcity of resources, we, which is, um, you know, happening almost in all the spices growing areas uh, in the world, water, labor, and shortage of fertilizers. Even in an advanced developed country like the US, we find that uh, the cultivation of uh, red peppers is affected very badly by the shortage of fertilizers. Third one is, uh, you know, the increased cost of freights, logistics, and uh, disruption, you know, caused by the pandemic in this area, which is a, a common topic which all of us speak whenever we meet. And this is, uh, although it has eased a little bit now, but it is nowhere compared to what it was uh, just two years back. And uh, climate change related issues, uncertainty in outputs, weather changes, unseasonal rains, uh, which is affecting the crop uh, all over the world, caused by climate change. Uh, price volatility, which has always been there, especially in pepper, uh, continues to be with us, pandemic or no pandemic. And this is uh, something which we, as a community, need to address. This, again, is related to overproduction and shortage as you can see in the photograph, uh, crops, uh, I mean, the pepper plantation get wiped out. They are cut down and uh, replaced by other crops. And this, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, attitude causes uh, wide fluctuation in the supply uh, situation of pepper, uh, leading to price volatility. Sustainability uh, has become a very key area of concern for, for all the uh, you know, uh, you have, uh, it's an industry-wide issue, and a uh, lot of uh, may, many of our companies, leaders, uh, industry leaders have made commitments to address this issue, uh, whether it is addressing climate change or whether it is um, addressing the biodiversity issues or uh, many of the other common problems we face, hunger, uh, and those kind of issues, um, many of the industry leaders have openly made commitments that their companies would do something uh, concrete to bring down the effects of uh, uh, climate change, uh, uh, effects of various activities causing uh, major climate change. Uh, 
So these uh, all have to be considered by us in the industry as we, uh, you know, go about doing our business of buying, selling, processing, and shipping out the products. Food safety quality, again, uh, a major concern just to give you today uh, as a company or uh, as other organizations that deal in spices and herbs, uh, you know, every day, like I said, new things are coming up. Like currently key issues uh, are things like allergen, heavy metals now has become again a major issue. Of course, pesticide residue has always been a major issue. Uh, there are also uh, things like PAH, especially coming from pepper, which is sourced from Brazil, uh, and the foreign matter, the microbiology. So these are uh, something which are, uh, you know, uh, uh, making it more and more difficult for us to uh, source and maintain the supply chain of uh, spices and herbs, including pepper. So uh, this also, uh, you know, make sure that uh, uh, we have to address this issue in a more holistic way. And uh, it is not uh, good enough to continue the way we were uh, dealing with this, uh, these issues or the way we were sourcing and uh, handling pepper uh, and other spices. So as a company, what we have done uh, is to bring in key uh, interventions. And I will just um, share some of these things. The first and foremost is to develop partnerships in key growing regions. We believe that like some, uh, like uh, uh, Firna said, uh, as a single entity, we cannot do much. But as, uh, as a group or as, with partners by aligning with others, uh, we will be able to achieve much more. So partnerships in the key, key growing regions is one of the key strategy that we have adopted about four to five years back. Uh, second one is uh, the development of local entrepreneurs uh, along with the working, uh, along with the established players. Uh, this has also been something which we have done and which we have helped us uh, during this pandemic uh, months. Setting up direct linkages with the farming community. We believe that, uh, uh, you know, I think most of you will agree that uh, the to address the various issues that we just saw, whether it is allergens, heavy metals, or pesticide residue, the best way is to work with the farming community rather than trying to clean the product or trying to uh, test the product after it has been sourced. So we, this has also been a key change uh, in the way we have been sourced. And uh, to also look at the not only look at uh, our own uh, profits or our own um, you know, benefits, also look at how we can give back to the community, improve uh, the livelihood of farmers. Uh, so this also has been a key concern and we are uh, taking some steps to address this. Traceable sourcing, uh, provide complete traceability to end customers all the way back to the farm. Like uh, Firna also talked about digital technology, yes implementing using the powers of digi digital technology to bring some benefits to both the customers and the farmers. Uh, use of technology to help manage the supply chain better, making supply chain seamless. Uh, and uh, also we are uh, taking steps to address the greenhouse emission issue uh, by taking an inventory of the greenhouse emission that is currently uh, you know, being uh, put into the atmosphere by our current practices, and then to set aggressive targets to bring down the emission. Regenerative agriculture uh, and improvement of bio biodiversity is again uh, an intervention we are promoting basically because it goes in uh, not only improving the uh, livelihood of the farm, uh, farming community, but also goes in providing a cleaner environment reduction in the greenhouse gas uh, and uh, other benefits like preventing the uh, you know uh, spoilage of the soil or the land all these things uh, are going to help the industry in the long run again uh, other key area uh, which we have faced is and we have addressed is, is the problem in uh, delivering goods to the customers on time so slashing lead times to customers through uh, establishing warehouses at the destination 
and also improving the supply chain management. Again, uh, the digital technology has, has is playing a key role here so that there is a very good visibility uh, of the status, of the shipments and other benefits on the, being aware of what is happening and uh, preparing for that. Uh, also, the uh, partnership which I talked about is uh, also being uh, is also being established at the, with the customers and to come up with joint projects uh, with uh, equal commitment from uh, all the stakeholders. Uh, and uh, we also need to pay attention to all the multiple stakeholders who are involved in this, not just the buyers, the sellers. So these have been some of the changes and I will talk about some of the important ones. Uh, you know, we have uh, been uh, uh, looking at how we can uh, control the uh, various uh, farming uh, operations that we uh, support uh, in different parts of the world. And we have used uh, technology uh, to this end. Uh, we have all of our uh, activities, uh, such as growing and the uh, next level of process are all uh, digitalized and we are monitoring them uh, regularly and also using the other technology like the GPS technology to make sure uh, that uh, we are keeping track of uh, what is happening in these farms along with our field team. Uh, in Vietnam also we have started this uh, where Vietnam is our major source of pepper as of now and uh, although it is not uh, up to the same level as other regions Again, this has been caused by our inability to travel in Vietnam for the last one and a half to two years. However, we are catching up uh, in uh, Vietnam. And, uh, you know, we have already started bringing all our farms uh, on uh, this platform where we can really uh, see what is going on uh, and uh, help our field team to be more effective uh, and uh, uh, help the farmers in identifying the problems uh, and uh, providing them with timely uh, inputs. So this, are, this has uh, really helped us, especially uh, wherever we had already established this, uh, even if we could not travel there due to the restrictions uh, imposed by the uh, governments to counter COVID-19, we were able to really uh, effectively monitor the progress of the various programs and uh, uh, provide support uh, to the various farmers. Regenerative agriculture, we are really promoting this very aggressively. Some of those which are really relevant to pepper uh, is to uh, things like increasing the crop diversity, uh, mixed cropping and short duration crops also help farmers to uh, not really depend 100% on pepper which as you know, has a big uh, gestation period to start yielding. Look at the short-term crops uh, so that farmers can start earning income. And also uh, once the crops mature, uh, the uh, dependence on pepper will be reduced. And uh, this will help the farmers to, you know, uh, uh, tight over the lean patches when pepper prices are uh, not very attractive to them. Uh, another key initiative under this uh, program is to reduce the chemical fertilizers being applied. As you know, initially chemical fertilizers provide good returns to the farmer. However, in the long run, they are detrimental to the soil and uh, it is always a good practice to phase them out uh, in a planned manner. And that is also part of uh, uh, regenerative agricultural practices which we are promoting uh, with the farmers. Also encourage farmers to use biofertilizers and uh, you know solid or green manure. Help them to prepare compost and apply them. Another key uh, technology is the precision agriculture, where uh, you know by, by the use of uh, the GPS technology and the uh, satellite technology, we can provide very precise uh, inputs to the farmer so that they do not waste farm inputs. They do not waste. Uh, unnecessarily apply chemicals and fertilizers uh, without really knowing which part of their farms actually needs to be looked uh, to be tended to and which parts are already doing well. So this uh, technology is really helping the farmers to reduce their input costs. Uh, 
also uh, you know uh, other te techniques like uh, you know having um, uh, wooded areas uh, forest land preserving natural resources around the farm all these things are being promoted and wherever it is possible also use farm animals and uh, which can also go a long way in helping the farmers not only uh, get the better income but also to uh, you know be able to follow some of the techniques like uh, eliminating the use of chemicals so uh, i just show you some photographs where some of the techniques are being used like there are farms who are uh, where the farmer is uh, planting other crops along with pepper we already know about coffee or cardamom but also other crops like arachnid pineapples allspice cassava all these are go a long way in helping the farmers to diversify and also um, uh, to be able to be more uh, regenerative uh, in the farming practices papaya also we have seen in brazil there are many farms where the farmers are also having patches of other crops like fruits papaya tea uh, and uh, pepper also a very good combination so we do not encourage a single uh, a crop however it will take time uh, for the farmers to make this change but it is always good to make a start and uh, uh, develop the movement up towards uh, this initiative uh, we should encourage farmers uh, to have at least two crops uh, at the same time so that uh, you know uh, this can help in a, a number of ways even in the pest management two crops are found to be uh, much better uh, in addressing pests uh, and uh, uh, we have seen wherever uh, this technique has been adopted the use of pesticides has also been reduced uh, different plots on the same farm uh, with different crops is also a very good technique so these are some of the things use of farm animals this also we are encouraging and you can see in many places these are already being adopted in pepper and uh, we are encouraging more and more of these things to happen uh, going forward other techniques you can see that use of the farm waste uh, one of the key things we avoid is burning of all the uh, residues that are generated on a farm and these can these are all valuable uh, organic uh, matter which can be uh, put back into the soil and uh, again farmers are being trained to gather these and uh, either convert them into compost or put them back as mulching material or as an organic manure uh, back to the soil a uh, lot of um, farmers are now uh, switching they have understood the uh, usefulness of um, organic or bio uh, fertilizers and uh, uh, repellents so we uh, as you can see number of them are available and and we are encouraging uh, farmers to adopt more and more we are actually monitoring the amount of chemical fertilizers being applied and see how this is uh, re being reduced uh, over the years uh, i talked about partnership uh, one of the key changes we made in the last two to three years is moving away from multiple suppliers and to develop local partnerships where local um, you know uh, entrepreneurs are encouraged to set up uh, process units and they also work uh, along with the uh, established players so uh, so key features of, uh, of a partner uh, processor we have developed partner processor in all the major growing areas of spices and herbs and uh, in vietnam also we have developed key features is, is that we de we designed the, the plant uh, to meet the best uh, food safety and quality standards uh, which is uh, derived from griffith's um, philosophy of food safety and quality and uh, we also implement uh, good uh, food safety and quality systems and processes train the partners to implement them uh, we also guarantee that the entire uh, capacity would be uh, utilized uh, over a period of time and uh, we meet that commitment and also set up laboratories in these facilities so that the wasteful exercise of multiple testing or testing at the destination which can cause major problems uh, if the lot fails at the destination 
all these things are avoided and only approved lots uh, are shipped uh, out of the source of the origins also to develop programs on sustainable sourcing raw materials having a local partner uh, helps a lot uh, and uh, also uh, it um, helps to make long term commitment uh, to not only guarantee sourcing but also to say that we are there all the time providing technical inputs uh, to our partners which are then transmitted to the farming community transparency in pricing uh, also uh, is the benefit that comes out of this uh, having a local a local partnerships and partnerships are not only for processing but also for growing and uh, developing a network of farmers so we want to encourage uh, uh, the development of local businessmen uh, and uh, uh, which uh, will help in maintaining very good food safety and quality control and also will help us in establishing traceability in the supply chain and uh, you can see an example of how we have set up a unit which meets the best uh, food safety quality standard in the world again we talked about uh, technology precision agriculture here uh, just show you an example of how we can guide farmers you can see this a farm uh, is not uniform uh, it is not homogeneous but different uh, parts of the farm are the red one here shows that uh, this requires high level of attention that the crop has been doing very badly so this again using the satellite uh, technology where we can guide farmers uh, at which parts of their farms really need attention you can see here most of the farm is doing okay but certain parts requires his immediate attention so we divert our field officers to have a look at that uh, and then provide uh, uh, timely and uh, the right kind of uh, intervention this also helps you to uh, you know look at the weather pattern how the weather has been behaving over the last few years and uh, provide the inputs to the farmer on when they should actually uh, plant and how the uh, you know weather is likely to behave uh, in the coming coming month also monitor the temperature and also give forecast for the next uh, uh, you know uh, three to four weeks which will help farmers to plan their agricultural activities i also talked about community development which is again a very key uh, uh, you know uh, part of our intervention uh, which has helped us to establish loyalty with the farming community to be able to source under difficult times even during the pandemic uh, we have seen that uh, once we train the farmers of, of of safe practices how to protect themselves by wearing masks and by sanitizing their hands to maintain distances we were able to really ensure that farmers were kind of going about their business of cultivating harvesting and selling the produce at the same time a lot of uh, help given to farmers uh, on uh, on how to safely work there and provide them with other inputs uh, which uh, were needed at that time uh, farm to customer traceability i already talked about you can see that a typical supply chain uh, uh, would be of, of 27 months duration because uh, uh, the farming activity starts just after one harvest in the case of pepper uh, in the month of march or april when the farmers start applying fertilizers for the next season and if anything goes wrong here you will see the impact of that after 27 months when the crop has been processed and it has been delivered to the customer so that is why we we say that it is very very important to have traceable traceability in the sourcing and uh, we have taken a lot of steps to do that uh, advantages of that is to help build trust of brands uh, and the product helps in building sustainable supply chain assures buyer about the authenticity of the products better prepared for climate uncertainty easy to implement food safety practices and helps consumer develop a holistic outlook rather than a price centric uh, outlook so you can see that every product that we uh, currently that uh, this is not yet implemented in pepper but we have implemented in many of the other spices uh, we can trace back just with the help of a qr code all the way back to the farm very briefly i'll give you a quick demo on this uh, so that uh, we can move on to the next slides 
So if you scan that, uh, you know, the QR code, which is there on all the products that is shipped out from uh, the origin, you will get an idea of uh, you know, who are the farmers, or which, is the, which are the farms, which is the growing area. And uh, by clicking on that farm, you will get uh, all the details about the farmer as well as the farm uh, as to what uh, where the farm is located. You can zoom in and see where in the world the farm is from where the uh, product is uh, being delivered to the customer. And you can also see uh, other important aspects of what pesticides get sprayed and many other details uh, as per the requirement of the customers uh, can be presented to them by using a combination of digital technology and uh, having a field team uh, which who is trained in capturing this uh, information we can also see things like uh, uh, you know what were the border crops what are the neighboring farms whatever you want can be you know, presented here uh, provided you have captured that information whether it is quality parameters what kind of quality uh, checking has been done what testing was done, pesticides sprayed, and so on and so forth. So this just to give you, I will skip the rest of this and move on. Uh, the last uh, part of the changes we made uh, is this uh, improvement in the supply chain management, or what we call as uh, supply chain innovation. So here, uh, uh, we started uh, uh, developing warehouses uh, at the uh, destination and started uh, implementing um, uh, supply chain management to hold stocks and maintain stocks very close to the end customer. Uh, this helped a lot, especially uh, when there was disruption in the shipments, when there was delay in the lead time. And local warehousing uh, uh, at the destination markets helped a lot in ensuring that uh, products were supplied on time uh, to the customers and also a direct linkage of the customer supply chain with the, uh, our partner uh, who is processing the products so that the status of all the shipments were seamlessly uh, available to all the uh, customers digital tracking of the status uh, and uh, providing um, uh, you know uh, almost uh, uh, seamless information to the customers and uh, during the last two years, uh, in spite of uh, disruption uh, to uh, ocean freight movement, we did not have a single day of stock out in these categories, that is the spices and herbs, uh, because of these uh, steps. Uh, you can see that um, you know, we have uh, different uh, factories located, which are shown here in the yellow blocks. And we have partner processors who are shown in the red here. Uh, and we were able to combine the, uh, you know, the benefits of having partner processors and uh, having the end warehouses uh, by ensuring that there is a seamless supply chain established between the two, which is linked to the customers who could then draw material from their closest warehouse, which helped a lot uh, when the during the difficult times. So uh, these are uh, I just wanted to share this. And I hope um, this experience that we had, uh, which I'm sharing now, will be of help. Ultimately, uh, my personal uh, uh, opinion is that uh, pandemic or no pandemic, COVID or no COVID, these changes were anyway going to happen uh, because they were absolutely necessary uh, for the long, uh, long term survival of the global spices business. However, what pandemic did was it accelerated these changes. So people saw the urgency and uh, the various players uh, in the spices industry began, began to react much more quickly uh, because of the uh, pandemic. I'm sure most of you uh, will, will relate to this because all these changes are uh, being brought in by several players in the industry. And I hope that uh, this presentation will be of use to uh, all of us to uh, make changes which are relevant to the current uh, situation. So that's it. Uh, and uh, so just should that we take questions now or uh, we wait in the so end? Just to remind uh, our audience, uh, there will be a panel discussion at the end of all the presentations. 
and they are requested to uh, post their uh, questions. Uh, there is a WhatsApp number available on the screen, or if they're logged in into Zoom, there is a chat room, they can also enter the questions over there. And at the end of all presentations, we are going to have all the panelists and uh, a small discussion will be done on, on all the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Rao. It was a, a fantastic presentation uh, on aligning the, aligning the value chain uh, as per the new normal. In fact, as you suggested, the pandemic has accelerated uh, the alignment uh, uh, for most of the uh, sector and uh, sooner the better. Uh, over to uh, Ms. Laura for the presentation on uh, the regulations that are coming forth in the United States uh, in the realm of black pepper. Over to you, Laura. Wonderful. Uh, good evening to all of you, or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you and share some updates about what's happening with the U.S. regulatory environment. For those of you who are familiar with AFTA, the American Spice Trade Association, we represent the importers, growers, processors, and sellers of spices in the United States. And it is core to our mission that we collaborate with our partner organizations such as IPC all around the world. This is absolutely crucial to our success as a global industry. Today, I'm going to give you an update on the regulatory environment in the United States. I'm going to focus on regulations related to pesticides and heavy metals, and I'll also share some general information about import requirements in the United States at the end of my presentation, as well as give you a heads up on some of the emerging regulatory issues that you can expect to see more information about in the coming years. So to start off with, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on the legal framework for regulating pesticides in the United States, since this is rather complicated. There are a few agencies that are involved in the process. The Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, is the agency that establishes tolerances for pesticide residues on food. However, it is the Food and Drug Administration that enforces these tolerances. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about enforcement by FDA later on and what you can expect of the enforcement environment in the United States. But right now I'll just say that it is FDA's responsibility and predominantly where we see this enforcement taking place is at the stage of import. There are several laws and regulations that pertain to the establishment of pesticide residues as they relate to food products. But the big picture is that a food that contains a pesticide residue that either does not have a tolerance, or if that residue is higher than the established tolerance, is considered to be adulterated and illegal in the United States. I want to emphasize that if there is no tolerance established for a specific spice, such as black pepper, then it is our policy in the United States that that tolerance is interpreted as zero, meaning there can be absolutely no residues of that chemical on the spice. We don't officially allow for any de minimis levels regardless of, of the level that's observed, even if there's no health or safety concern. As I mentioned a little later on, I'm going to talk about more of the realities of the enforcement risks as they relate to spices, but this is the official letter of the law. Therefore, it is in our best interest as a global spice industry, both to obtain as many tolerances as we can to cover the commodities that we import and to ensure that there are no residues of chemicals for which there are either no tolerances established or those chemicals that are occurring on the spice do not exceed the tolerances that are established. Next, I wanna move into a discussion about what's going on with chlorpyrifos. You may have already heard something about this and certainly chlorpyrifos has been getting a lot of attention on the international stage in recent years. Uh, the EU recently banned chlorpyrifos a couple of years back. And in the United States, there has been quite a uh, 
political agenda as it relates to this particular chemical, dating back to the Obama administration when the US government at that point had taken steps to ban the chemical. After the Trump administration came into office, they halted that ban and the chemical was continued to be permitted to be used. However, shortly after the Biden administration came into office, they announced that they were revoking all of the US tolerances for chlorpyrifos. And what is particularly concerning and problematic about this initiative is that they established a very, very rapid deadline for the implementation of the ban. And that, will actually, that is actually scheduled to be going into effect within about a week. There were several, uh, currently technically are, uh, for about a week longer, several existing chlorpyrifos tolerances for spices that will be expiring. There are tolerances for chili peppers, peppermint, spearmint, and onion. There has never been, there is not, and there likely never will be a, a tolerance for, for chlorpyrifos on black pepper. So under our existing policies in the United States, currently any detectable level of chlorpyrifos on black pepper would be considered illegal and is not allowed. It's not really impacted by the ban. This was already the situation before the ban went into effect. The ban really only impacts those commodities and chemicals for those commodities for which there already was a chlorpyrifos tolerance, but that is not the case with black pepper. ASDA uh, has been advocating for the FDA to exercise enforcement discretion on the import of spices that contain chlorpyrifos residues. And this has been part of a broader initiative that we've been partnering with the broader food and beverage industry in the United States to make the case that the deadline was too rapid for us, that we need additional time to come into compliance with the new regulations. And in fact, earlier this month, FDA published guidance that heard the industry's concerns and has provided uh, a plan to offer enforcement discretion on the residues of chlorpyrifos um, of imported commodities and commodities in the United States for a period of, of about six months to two years and then some existing discretion for uh, another couple of years. So, you know, that does offer us some buffer. However, once again, this only really applies to those commodities for which there is an expiring tolerance as the commodities such as black pepper that never had a tolerance would not officially be subject to this enforcement discretion. In the meantime, we have seen a lawsuit filed by a coalition of farm and agricultural organizations in the United States asking EPA to halt the ban. So there is still some hope amongst the food and ag industry in the United States that this may pause or stop the ban of chlorpyrifos. Uh, we still just don't know what's going to happen, but there is some, some potential that we're going to see uh, the ban reversed or, or delayed as a result of this lawsuit. So once again, as it relates to black pepper, there has never been a US tolerance for chlorpyrifos on black pepper. So the tolerance is officially zero and the ban does not change this situation. However, I think there are a number of questions that our industry has as it relates to the actual enforcement environment for chlorpyrifos on imported commodities. Are we expecting that we're going to see more enforcement at the port by FDA of chlorpyrifos? Will FDA start to target commodities that they didn't particularly screen very much before? These are some of the questions that the industry has. And of course, we don't uh, have all the answers at this point in time. But what I can say is that in general, FDA's screening of pesticide residues on spices is relatively infrequent. And I don't foresee that that will change as a result of this new policy. 
FDA has explicitly told ASTA in conversations that we've had with the head of the Office of Imports that screening for pesticide residues on spices is not a priority. FDA's top priority as it relates to spices is salmonella, and they recognize that the issues of pesticides are not as big of a food safety concern, and therefore they put fewer resources against the enforcement. Additionally, we've seen this FDA guidance published that indicates that the agency is going to offer some additional time for industry to come into compliance. Well, officially, this does not apply to those commodities that did not already have a tolerance for chlorpyrifos. I think that the reality of the situation, how I expect that this will play out practically, is that likely we will not see significant enforcement by FDA of chlorpyrifos at import during this timeline, because I think it's just something that, that they're signaling to us through the publication of this guidance that, that they're going to offer some, some discretion in the way for a period of time. It, on my first slide in this section, I explained that we have a zero tolerance for any chemical that there is no established tolerance for. And while that is the official policy, unofficially the FDA does allow for some discretion as it relates to very, very, very low levels of pesticides that are observed on food. So typically this would be less than 10 parts per billion upon which we would see that FDA will not take action. Uh, so that is something that gives a, a, a little bit of leeway. So the bottom line here is that this is certainly something that we need to be aware of as an industry, make strides to reduce the use of chlorpyrifos, remove any uh, commodities that have chlorpyrifos residues on them from export to the US market, but I do not expect to suddenly see a significant change in the enforcement environment as it relates to FDA. What I do expect that you will experience is likely your customers are going to be asking you questions about this. This ban has been very highly publicized and now the food companies in the United States are suddenly in a situation where they're very aware of chlorpyrifos and it's very important to them that they start evaluating their supply chains to make sure that they can come into compliance with FDAs to make sure that they don't have a negative news story that comes out about having an illegal chlorpyrifos residue in their supply chain. So what I will expect is that you're going to start getting questions from your customers about the use of chlorpyrifos in your supply chain, uh, that you'll start getting requests for testing of chlorpyrifos on the product. And um, the reason for this is that uh, the the companies in the United States want to make sure that they're legally complying with the law, even if we recognize that there is some discretion that's happening with FDA right now, and they want to avoid any lawsuits or any negative media attention. So that kind of covers off on the issue of chlorpyrifos, but what about other chemical residues? So I have up here on the screen the entire list of all the current US tolerances that are available for black pepper. As you can see, this is not a very long list. There are only a few tolerances that are available for black pepper. Recognizing that this has been a problem for the industry, ASTA has taken an effort to petition the EPA to establish more tolerances for black pepper. And in 2021, we've seen the publication of two new tolerances for black pepper. One is for metalaxyl for 0.3 parts per million, and the other is for diphenoconazole for 0.1 parts per million. The establishment of a tolerance by EPA requires fairly extensive resources. The agency will require that whoever is petitioning provide a significant amount of data, and there are significant costs associated with the application. There recently was a change in how FDA in how EPA uh, reviews this data. In the past, EPA would require that there be field trials that would be submitted to support the application of 
a pesticide tolerance for an imported commodity. However, ASTA was able to make the case to EPA that this is not a practical arrangement for spices, given the nature of how our commodities are traded and commingled. And based on our advocacy, EPA has agreed that ASTA may use monitoring data in place of the field trial data. And this uh, reduces the resources required to submit a petition to the EPA significantly, which is why we have started the process now of starting to petition EPA for more tolerances because the barrier to submitting the petitions has now become lower. And those two new tolerances for metalaxyl and diphenyconazole that asked a petition were based on this new policy of being able to provide the monitoring data. So what this means is that we know that we can be effective at establishing new tolerances. However, we do still need to have that data. And we do have a couple of new petitions in the pipeline that we are working on. One is to um, extend the tolerance that's available for azoxystrobin on other spices of 38 parts per million to also apply to black pepper. Uh, we are planning to submit a petition together with some other commodity groups in March to ask for this to happen. I should also mention that it is not a very fast process. Once you submit the petition with all of the data, which of course takes a significant time to be able to consolidate, the agency can take between 18 months and two years in order to grant the petition. And we've actually seen that they have been significantly delayed recently due to understaffing and challenges related to the pandemic. We're also planning to submit a petition for cypermethrin. And this is based on the codex uh, tolerance. So the idea is that it would cover uh, fruit and berry spices and root and rhizome spices. So this is a little bit of a different process than the petitions that we submitted previously, which were based on monitoring data. So we're still working with EPA exactly on the details of how this process will work for us, but we're hoping that we'll work that out with them within the next month or two and be able to submit the petition for cybermethrin as well. It is possible for us to pursue other chemicals. And this is a real opportunity for us to collaborate as a global industry, since your industry knows which chemicals are being used by farmers, uh, to what extent and what the residues are of those chemicals on black pepper. Since we need to be able to submit that data, we need at least 70 data points for each pesticide uh, and those need to be detectable levels. It cannot be below the level of detection. So 70 detected data points to be able to support the petition. So there is an opportunity for us to collaborate on pursuing future chemicals, uh, future uh, pesticide tolerance petitions. But I will note that some chemicals are just not gonna be possible due to the political environment. Obviously chlorpyrifos is, is very, uh, challenging right now, given the situation of the ban and how much attention and, and political challenge there is with that chemical. Same thing with the chemical carbendism. There's just never going to be a possibility to pursue that chemical. And there are a number of others for which we just will, will not really have the opportunity, given the safety of the chemical or the political nature around it, to pursue new tolerances for. But there are others for which it may be possible. So this is certainly an opportunity for us to, to work together as an industry to reduce all of our risk. Beyond establishing new tolerances, since certainly there are these chemicals for which we're just never going to be able to get tolerances in the United States, given the political situation, it is also really important that in order to reduce our risk that we continue to work at origin in order to provide farmer training on the use proper use of agricultural chemicals. ASTA has been partnering with a coalition with the Sustainable Spice Initiative, IDH, the European Spice Initiative, uh, the Euro European Spice Association and the Vietnamese Pepper Association over the last five years on a project to promote sustainable farming practices, which is predominantly centered around providing information and training on responsible agricultural 
ag agrochemical use and residue policies. Uh, so far, this project in Vietnam has been successful at developing a more compliant black pepper supply. And we're excited to continue this partnership to further uh, work towards having a more compliant supply. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the issue of heavy metals. Back in November, there was a publication in the journal Consumer Reports, uh, which is a very, very well-known investigative journal uh, that highlighted the potential for spices to be contaminated with heavy metals. According to the report, about one third of the spices that they tested, they tested about 140 samples of spices uh, that they found had levels of heavy metals that they found to be of concern. Asked to take some issue with the methodology that was used by this publication, but it has received some significant attention by the public and other media outlets. Additionally, we're seeing governmental attention to the issue of heavy metals in spices on the international level, on the federal level within the United States and with specific states in the United States, such as California and New York. Uh, for those of you who may be following the Codex Alimentarius process, this uh, group establishes global uh, limits for a variety of contaminants in commodities. This group is working on the process of establishing proposed maximum levels for lead in spices. And uh, the latest round of the proposals I have up on the screen here, Codex tends to take a long time. Uh, so I would not, um, and, and go through many, many different iterations and revisions. So I would not necessarily see these levels as being final at this point in time. But what is interesting about this process is that the Codex levels are uh, differing based on the type of spice or herb. And this is a similar approach to what we've seen the EU adopt. The EU back in 2021 recently adopted proposed limits for heavy metals in spices as well. And there were different levels that were established for different types of spices. This seems to be like a good process for the industry because based on the kind of, of spice, you can see differences in, in the heavy metals naturally occurring. So this, this seems to be working well on the international level. Federally in the United States right now, the majority of the attention as it relates to heavy metals is on uh, heavy metals in foods that are consumed by babies and toddlers. Uh, there was a congressional report early in 2021 that highlighted concerning levels of heavy metals in baby food. And in response to this congressional report, FDA has launched what they refer to as their Closer to Zero initiative, which is a process that they are working to establish limits for heavy metals in baby foods. We have been in close communication with the FDA about this process and they have specifically told us that they're not concerned about spices and they're not at this time planning on establishing federal limits for heavy metals in spices. We have worked with FDA on the issue of heavy metals and spices for many years. And while there is no official guidance level in the United States for heavy metals, the US FDA has informed ASTA that they use one part per million as an unofficial limit for heavy metals in spices. Uh, so we will continue to monitor this and to work with FDA and potentially it could be within our interest to actually see an official limit or official limits established by FDA uh, for spices because we are seeing some activity on the state level that makes it very challenging uh, for us to comply. So what we saw is that in May of 2021, New York State announced new action levels for heavy metals in spices. And these action levels are very low and very challenging for the industry to comply with. Uh, they announced a new level of 0.21 
parts per million for lead and inorganic arsenic and 0.26 parts per million for cadmium. Immediately, ASTA responded to New York and indicated that these levels were not achievable for the industry and that we would have problems with the implementation of these levels. Based on our advocacy efforts, the state has now put these levels on hold while they do further research into the issue. And we are continuing to advocate for the state to use a different approach to establish different levels. So at this point, we at least have some time before these start to go into effect because we've been able to successfully tell the state that the industry will not be able to comply with these levels. At the same time, we also have issues in the state of California as it relates to Proposition 65, uh, which tends to result in a fair bit of litigation related to the um, heavy metal content in spices. And we have now also seen some class action litigation in response to the publication of the Consumer Reports article. I want to touch on the issue of salmonella since this continues to be the top food safety priority for the foods for the spice industry and it is FDA's priority as it relates to the screening of imported spices. FDA under the Food Safety Modernization Act requires that all companies have a validated kill step for salmonella to be applied to spices before those spices are consumed by the final end consumer. That kill step can be applied either at origin or it can be applied within the United States, but it needs to be applied at some point in time prior to the food being uh, given to the consumer. The uh, validation studies that FDA is requiring are quite extensive, and um, this has been a challenge for our industry. What we're starting to see is that FDA is fairly heavily screening spices at import for the presence of salmonella. And if the spices are found to be positive for salmonella, FDA is saying, well, I want to see your validation study. Uh, if that product will be treated in the United States, I wanna see your validation study before we're, we're going to release the, uh, the salmonella from our uh, import alert and hold. Uh, and as FDA is looking through the validation studies, they're being very, they're, they're holding uh, the industry to a very, very high standard for what those studies must entail. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is that it, there are so many different spices that sometimes companies you know, would like to do a validation study on one spice and have that be applicable to a group of spices. And that is permitted, but there needs to be a certain amount of evidence that can be provided in the study that shows that that is scientifically valid. So ASTA is working on publishing resources for the industry. We have a paper on salmonella detection methods. We've provided a liter literature review on irradiation that demonstrates that a five kilogram dose of irradiation is sufficient to achieve a five log reduction of salmonella in spices. And we're working on providing updated guidance on how to provide validation studies for groups of spices in a way that FDA will find ex acceptable. And that is coming soon. So I was asked to provide a, just a little bit of information on the general import requirements for spices into the United States. And so I have a little bit of information on the screen on the key requirements for importing spices into the United States. I also have an email address for Customs and Border Protection import specialists who can provide more information about the documentation requirements. And I would advise that any companies uh, who are looking to get involved in importing food to the United States who have not in the past, consider working with a licensed customs broker to assist with the import requirements as that may be a practical way to help come into compliance. And there are lists of those licensed customs brokers on the uh, Customs and Border Protection website. The FDA also provides a list of what the requirements are for imported food products. So it's important to be aware of the prior notice of imported foods requirement, uh, as well as compliance with the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. And you can see more about these requirements uh, at the link on the screen. 
finally, I just wanted to touch on a few emerging regulatory issues that we could expect to see more of in the coming years. Uh, the FDA has launched an initiative called the New Era of Food Safety, and this is very focused on tech-enabled traceability. So while technically we don't have these traceability requirements in effect now, we clearly see that this is something that FDA is very interested in and wants to see the industry starting to embrace more of. I also want to note that last year we saw the passage of the FASTER Act, which adds sesame as a major allergen in the United States, which means that any product containing sesame must be labeled uh, to with it with an allergen label to uh, inform the consumer that it, the product may contain sesame. And if products are processed together with sesame, there needs to be good manufacturing practices in place to ensure that the cross contact is managed. Finally, I want to note that we're seeing more attention at Customs and Border Protection on the potential of goods to be produced with forced labor. While at the moment this is really focused on China, uh, we expect to see much more broad uh, concerns from Customs and Border Protection about the issue of forced labor. And the challenge here is that uh, there are fairly significant documentation requirements that are, are also somewhat unclear to the industry what exactly will be able to be offered for uh, compliance purposes. So that's something that we expect to, to see more of and be working on as an industry in the future. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I finally just want to note that we are having our first in-person annual meeting since the start of the pandemic in Miami, April 10th to 12th. I hope you guys will all join us. Registration is open. So if you have an interest in traveling to the meeting, please, please uh, feel free to join us. And that brings me to the end of, of my presentation. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Laura. That was uh, a very nice presentation. And indeed, you gave us good insights on what is going to happen with uh, chloropyrifos, which uh, most of the industry participants have been asking for the past six months. And in addition to that, uh, heavy metals or uh, other parameters at the salmonella, this would be actually very helpful for everybody right from the growers to processors to traders, et cetera, uh, who would be shipping their products to the US market or want to ship the products to the US market. Thank you, indeed. Yeah, next uh, I'm going to present on the country reports. Uh, what we do at each conference is that we invite the uh, various IPC country members to present their crop report which includes their uh, trade data, uh, estimates for the immediate past year, and certain projections for the next immediate year as to what are they estimating their crop to be, how much exports and area of plantation, et cetera. Now, due to the uh, travel restrictions, or I would say despite the travel restrictions, uh, the countries have done a fantastic job. Uh, all the IPC member countries have submitted the reports and uh, on behalf of the ED and the whole team, I would like to thank them uh, for submitting their reports. Uh, while these are estimates and uh, some industry participants may agree or may not agree with these estimates, we have to respect the position what the IPC members have presented. And uh, one has to make his own uh, estimation of uh, what could the numbers be looking like. Now, the presentation that I'm going to make has a lot of numbers. I have uh, tried to make it as simple as possible. Uh, we have chosen at least two or three slides for every country, and we made a summary uh, of all the country reports. So uh, uh, can uh, Budiman please share the slides uh, from that side? Yeah, so uh, while the title may say demand and supply, we will be focusing much more on supply and crop reports first, and then we would briefly touch upon what is happening on the demand side. Uh, next slide, please. 
so the structure of presentation is as follows we look at the country wise trade and production starting with vietnam we move it to india indonesia malaysia and sri lanka of course uh, the non ipc countries uh, with uh, significant uh, crops such as brazil cambodia etc those have been covered but uh, they have been covered in the uh, uh, balance sheet at the end of the presentation and finally we look at the demand and certain forces that are acting on the prices uh, well uh, we are seeing certain questions asked by attendees that when will the price rise etc we will discuss all that in the uh, panel discussion uh, and of course uh, we cannot give a price guidance as such you know the industry participants have to make their own uh, uh, deductions and based on that uh, they have to you know uh, take actions in the market so what we will be presenting to you is uh, the uh, what has happened in the previous year and what is projected uh, by the uh, ipc members next slide please uh, starting with vietnam if you look at the graph on the left side the blue bars are uh, the exports in thousands metric ton and the orange bars are the imports in thousand metric ton so vietnam uh, the largest exporter globally uh, somewhere close to 50% or maybe even more uh, if you look at uh, the data their exports have been steadily increasing from 2000 uh, or 2015 right up to 2019 and then they start sliding uh, in 2021 vietnam exported close to 262000 metric ton and imported 45000 metric ton now this 45000 metric ton also includes the flows that came in from the border from cambodia if you look at customs data it is only 25000 tons but uh, bpa has made uh, more clear that you know this 45000 ton also includes the flows coming from cambodia now over the years vietnam has positioned itself as a processing base for cleaned whole steam sterilized and milled paper uh, the exports for 2020 and 2021 lower to the previous years now this is also because perhaps the crop is reducing slowly and that is also seen uh, uh, that prices are firming up vietnam imports asta black pepper from brazil and indonesia and in 2021 this was uh, including cambodia around 45000 tons next slide if we look at the export uh, and import values uh while the exports rose from 2015 up to 2019 one could see that the export value which peaked in 2016 at 1.4 billion started sliding from 1.4 billion to somewhere close to 600 million in 2020 because uh the prices of black pepper came down uh from 9 dollars per kilo to 2 dollars per kilo and that fall in these years has reduced the export turnover even though the volume would have increased likewise the imports also slid from 200 million to 49 million and now they are suddenly rising slowly uh, as prices have risen in 2020 and 2021 so if you see in 2021 vietnam though it exported slightly lower than what it exported in 2020 the value of export has gone up to 950 million and imports to 125 million the point here we are making is that the rise in the value of exports is riding on the back of the increase in prices uh if we look at the arbitrage or the difference in the export value per ton and import value per ton uh from 2015 to 2019 there used to be a healthy arbitrage and this made it possible for vietnamese processors who have invested in steam sterilization in eto in cleaning lines etc to import uh, uh, black pepper from uh, indonesia from cambodia from brazil uh, bring it into vietnam process it and we export it what has happened in 2019 and 2020 the freights have suddenly gone up and when we when when we are discussing about the new normal or there are some questions on the new normal we'll discuss in the uh, uh, panel discussion also what and why we kept the presentations or the theme as sustainability of pepper and aligning with the new normal one of the significant uh, part of the new normal is that yes we are back to normal after the pandemic or the pandemic may be continuing to stay you know but we are we are getting on with our lives after the vaccination but still the new normal here means essentially that the freight rates are not going to go back perhaps 
to the pre-COVID era. They may slide, but we, one could not expect uh, a $20,000 container being shipped to the US to go back to $3,000. It may take some time. And this is what one has to understand and align himself with the new normal. And this is where Mr. Rao was presenting that it is not just that one has to depend on, on origins, but also start putting in systems at the destination to stock produce, to take care of the supply chain. Because, because transit times today have increased from 30 days to 60 days to 70 days, whatever you have because of port congestion, et cetera. So the point here is the arbitrage is coming down. And uh, this also means that the origins who were shipping to different origins for processing may have to look at actively investing in their origin itself to do value addition processing. Because it will not make perhaps sense for Vietnam to pay $400 per ton freight from Brazil, bring it to Vietnam and process it and again, reship it back uh, to Europe or to USA. Uh, so this is what the arbitrage basically shows that the pain coming from the freight. Next slide. Vietnam production. Uh, if we look at the blue curve here, that is the area in hectares. Now, as the prices rose, uh, the farmers planted a lot of black pepper in Vietnam. And uh, once the prices bottomed out, there was enormous pain because they could not recover their investments and there were foreclosures, et cetera. And farmers also found more meaning in, you know, adopting different crops. And there was a crop shift in planting into passion fruit, into jackfruit, into uh, uh, coffee, et cetera. And the, the plantation area steadily dropped and now it has come even below 100,000 100, hectares. Uh, production, on the other hand, peaked at around 255,000 tons in 2018. Please also uh, keep in mind, while Vietnam would be exporting 290 or 287, they are also importing 4050. So you have to add that number to this production number to reach that export level. The uh, projection in, uh, or the estimates first for 2021, uh, what we had presented last year were somewhere close to 210 to 220,000 tons. Uh, VPA has revised that 280. And for 2022, they are projecting a number of 162,000 tons. Now, this is coming on the back of less conducive weather, uh, higher farming inputs due to inflation, and uh, uh, less interest by the farmers to enter into new plantations. And that is why uh, the uh, production numbers in Vietnam have been dropping. Next slide, please. So if you look at the Vietnam summary, the balance sheet, uh, uh, before I explain the numbers, I would like to mention that, uh, yes, some of the industry participants may feel that the crop for 2021 and 2022 are you know, under balls. And uh, uh, VPA has you know, added the uh, or their position is that there was a lot of carryover stock in Vietnam, which farmers did not sell. And uh, later when prices started rising, all this stock came to the market and the exports happened. If you look at the red circles, these are that is basically the total production. For 2020, we were at 240. Now 2021, we have gone down to 180. And then 2022, it is estimated to come down to 162. If you look at the green circles, Exports of 286, 263, and what they project for next year is going to be 245. So with the crop coming down, prices going up, uh, the uh, estimation is that the exports also from Vietnam uh, would come down. Uh, let us uh, bear in mind, uh, Vietnam, although a very large exporter, does not have very huge domestic consumption. Vietnam's domestic consumption is somewhere close to eight to 9,000 tons and not uh, uh, like India or uh, any other country where the uh, large population base determines the domestic consumption. Next slide. Let us look at India. Uh, India, which was a net exporter one time, is a net importer now. Uh, for the uh, uh, for 2022, uh, the estimation for domestic consumption is already touching 70,000 tons. Uh, they are not able to grow so much, so they are, are obviously importing a lot of volume. Uh, in general, India is importing black pepper from Brazil, from Indonesia, and from other origins, uh, from Vietnam, for processing and uh, re-exporting. Now, when we look at the uh, data for 2021, 
the total imports were 29,000 tons and exports were 20,000 tons. Uh, there is a uh, catch here uh, for the exports. When we say 20,000 tons, it also includes extracts, which are oleoresins and oils. And the conversion factor for these items uh, could be eight or nine or 10 times uh, because when they import raw material, the extraction, uh, post extraction, the amount becomes very small. So if we were to just write back that quantity, uh, then the imports and exports would almost balance out uh, for India in terms of imported uh, raw material. Uh, the source of import, as I already mentioned, is Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and Brazil, and occasionally Indonesia as well. Yeah, next slide. Next slide, please. Let us look at the breakup of the exports, which is uh, very interesting. If you look at the left graph, you would see that uh, we made two red arrows and then there are black arrows which are tending upwards. The two red arrows are basically whole black pepper and whole white pepper. Uh, in uh, 2021, the exports of whole black pepper and whole white pepper have reduced. Uh, definitely, the main reason over here is the increasing freights, which reduces the uh, uh, arbitrage. And if there is, so whole black pepper and whole white pepper has the least amount of value addition over there. And therefore, it renders the uh, Indian exporters slightly uncompetitive uh, because of increasing freights. But when we looked at milled pepper, green pepper, pepper oil, and pepper oil resin, the exports have risen because the value addition over there is far, far significant. And that is able to absorb even uh, shocks of freight, which could be four or five times what were there before the pre-COVID period. And the 70% the of exports of India is coming from basically milled pepper, green pepper, oil and olive resin, which is much higher on the value addition segment. And they have been able to do pretty well uh, in this uh, period. If you look at the export values uh, uh, per ton, uh, uh, if I look at the total, uh, we see $6,200 per ton uh, for uh, 2020 and 2021 going as high as $7,000 per ton. Uh, pepper oil is somewhere close to $47,000 per ton and green pepper at $8,000 per ton. Green pepper also includes uh, pepper in brine, etc. So therefore the average value looks slightly lower. Uh, next slide. Well, India production, they have uh, uh, changed the way they report their acreage uh, from 2018. If you would have seen in the presentation of Mr. Rao as well, that uh, Indian pepper farmers plant multiple crops, whether it is uh, uh, pineapple, rubber, or coffee, or multiple uh, crops, and then in that there are pepper wines. So they, cal they, they add up the entire acreage rather than just calculating the acreage of wine, uh, which is very difficult. So from 2019, the, the area of plantation has been fairly uh, stable uh, and uh, it is somewhere close to 250,000 hectare. And the production also has been uh, close to 60,000 tons. In 2021, the production was uh, at 67,000 tons. And for 2022, there is a marginal reduction expected at 60,000 tons. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah. So if you look at the Indian summary, uh, the production is expected to be slightly lower on account of weather, old wines and rising farming costs. The exports of 2022 are export, uh, expected to drop marginally due to decrease in exports of whole pepper. Domestic consumption is expected to be strong due to the opening up of domestic businesses, especially food service. So uh, as we see India, uh, although India is growing pepper in multiple provinces, uh, there is still a decent amount of requirement uh, in India, which it's not been able to meet by themselves and India would be a net importer. Next. Let us look at uh, Indonesia quickly. In 2021, there was an interesting trend in Indonesia. The exports uh, from 58,000 tons in 2020 dropped to 38,000 tons. Uh, this was not expected. Uh, the main reason for this perhaps was or what the trade uh, uh, informs us is a drop in the crop. The crop uh, was lower and therefore the prices that were available for the domestic market. Uh, 
here we have to note that indonesia is a big domestic consumer as well and therefore uh, the export prices were not competitive enough as compared to the domestic prices and a lot of pepper flu uh, went to the domestic market rather than it went for exports so uh, the reasons for shortages were as i said were cutbacks on farm inputs due to inflation old lands and nail plantations next one once again uh, the area fairly uh, similar at around 188000 hectare uh, while the exports were lower uh, the indonesian team is saying that the crop was okay at 81000 tons of course uh, there are uh, questions if 81000 tons was the crop then perhaps the carry over would be higher and that this is what they have shown in the balance sheet in the next slide if you look at their uh, exports which is in the uh, represented by the black arrows it was at 58000 tons for 2020 and it dropped to 37700 for 2021 uh, the stock brought forward uh, in 2021 was 11500 and now therefore uh, if the crop was 81 it is the stock carry forward is 29700 uh, as reported by them this carry forward is uh, you know one could have good discussion on this because had the carry forward been so high uh, perhaps the indonesian prices would have come down but they are not they're going up uh, of course they may be following uh, brazilian and vietnamese prices but as reported the stock uh, carry forward perhaps is higher and for 2022 indonesia is projecting once again a decent crop of 89000 tons uh, slightly higher than what they projected for 2021 next uh quickly we look at malaysia uh, once again a very uh, a stable uh, 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 crop uh, malaysia is producing somewhere in the range of 20000 tons and they have maintained that uh, the area uh, in 2016 and 2017 used to be somewhere close to 16000 hectares the area has dropped as the prices came off however whatever was left uh, due to a good intervention by uh, uh, the uh, uh, participants in malaysia the yields have gone up and with the same uh, uh, with lower hectares they are being able to produce uh, higher uh, quantities of production uh, if you look at their trade uh, export and import uh, in 2021 their exports were close to 7000 tons uh, slightly shy of what they did in 2020 Uh, but in general they used to do around 12000 tons from 2016 to 2018 but that is now reduced and it has been reducing from 2019 and they are exporting less perhaps because domestic consumption is also rising the the major destination for malaysian paper is essentially japan uh, while for other countries they have been shipping to uh, multiple destinations as such but for malaysia japan is one of the most important markets next quickly looking at sri lanka uh if uh, you all could recollect there was uh, economic distress uh, which led to currency depreciation and if you look at the 2021 number the exports have suddenly gone or uh, more than doubled from 7000 tons in 2020 to 16000 tons uh currency depreciation also reduces the export price and of course uh, the country was in need of uh us dollars and they have exported uh, a large portion uh, of what they grow and they exported 16000 tons uh so why they produce only 24 to 25000 tons less went to the domestic market and significant portion of it got exported um next slide so now we come to the global balance sheet where we have two sections one is the ipc countries which includes india indonesia malaysia sri lanka vietnam let me just explain this table to you first uh, before we look at the numbers on the leftmost column we have the country name uh, we also have included brazil china thailand madagascar cambodia equator etc which form part of the non ipc member countries which are growing significant amount of pepper uh, on the top we look at 2021 estimation and 2022 projections stock brought forward is basically the carry over from the previous year which is brought forward into the year production is the uh, crop output imports uh, are uh, 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 
mentioned here. Uh, then after import comes the domestic consumption and then the export. So the stock brought forward into next year is essentially the total uh, available paper uh, subtracted by what was taken out. So stock brought forward plus production plus import, uh, less domestic consumption and less export will be equal to the stock brought forward. If you look at India, we already mentioned that the production is marginally lower, lower from 67,000 tons to 60,000 tons. The stock brought forward in India is also uh, uh, quite similar and in balance. Uh, the exports in India are expected to be 19 to 20,000 tons. The key factor over here is there is going to be large uh, uh, domestic consumption in, in India, which is expected for 2022. Indonesia, once again, uh, the production is expected to uh, be slightly better from 81,000 tons go to 89,000 tons. Uh, although this is, as I said, debatable because uh, the production in 2021 was not uh, uh, good enough. Uh, and so perhaps this is slightly at a higher base. And because of being at a higher base, one sees a, one sees a large amount of stock being brought forward and therefore the carry forward uh, at the end of 2022 increases from 29 to 54. Uh, Malaysia is fairly constant, Sri Lanka is fairly constant. Vietnam, uh, if you look at the stock brought forward for 2021, they have uh, revised the estimation and they say to that 124,000 tons and the crop is was actually for 2021 at 180. And uh, despite that, they were able to achieve an export of uh, 264. Uh, so 180 plus 45 is 220, and then they had a lot of stock there. So 40,000 tons came out from the uh, stock there with the farmers. And as prices rose in 2021, this got exported. 2022, the carry forward uh, reduces as a large quantity got exported. And the crop again projected as somewhere close to 162,000 tons. Imports would be similar. And therefore, the stock carry forward after 2022 uh, would be lower. When uh, looking at Brazil, uh, we do not have clear estimates on the stock brought forward or carry forward. However, we do know that Brazil exported 92,000 tons in 2021. And the crop for Brazil in 2022 is expected to be slightly higher or similar uh, from 99,000 tons reaching 101. Some people are at 95, some are at 110. So the average estimates are coming to 100,000 tons. China. Uh, again, fairly uh, constant because only one province, that is the province in Hainan, grows pepper at 30,000 tons. And uh, we are looking at uh, a large domestic consumption there as well, close to 75,000 tons, which is very near what India is consuming. All other countries are pretty much similar. Cambodia, uh, again, at 20,000 tons. So when we look at the totals, the global production uh, for 2021 was at 537,000 tons, which moves to 522,000 tons. So whatever the numbers, it is important that one looks at the difference. And one, once one looks at the difference is what one gets the real picture that what is going to happen perhaps in the next year and we see in the next slide. So if you look at production, 2021, 537,000 tons, and 2022, it is going to be slightly lower at 520,000 tons, which is a drop of 3%. Uh, now, this is the difference. If somebody would say that, no, 2021 numbers uh, were slightly underballed, so were numbers of 2022. So the difference remains constant over there, and the difference is coming somewhere close to 3% drop. Uh, imports uh, are also going to drop because as production is going to drop, countries are going to need pepper for their own domestic consumption and therefore uh, they will not be able to perhaps import more. Likewise, export also may drop because the overall production is dropping. Domestic consumption is increasing and therefore the carry forward is going to reduce by somewhere close to 8%. So these are numbers are fairly consistent in terms of uh, when we look at them because uh, the percentages, one must remember, are at a different base. When I say 3% drop at 500,000 uh, of production, it is 15,000 tons. So we are going to see that the production is dropping by 15,000 tons uh, and uh, carry forward also drops by somewhere around 16,000 tons. So production and carry forward uh, both drop by those 30,000 tons on an overall basis. 
which brings uh, somewhere uh, close to five to six percent of uh, uh, removal of inventory from the system. Because if you say production and carry forward put together, uh, we are going to you know uh, get somewhere close to uh, thirty thousand tons out from the system. Then there is there is going to be that small difference of five to six percent happening over there. Next, quickly we look at what is happening globally. Factors causing gradual increase in demand, essentially growing population in the developing world, higher protein consumption with increasing incomes. Now one may contest that okay, uh, you know, there may be certain negative sense sentiment toward meat consumption. Although meat consumption keeps increasing, yes, but we are not essentially talking of meat. We are talking of protein consumption. Even if you are going to consume plant-based protein, you would still need seasoning to season your uh, plant-based protein. So as long as Uh, incomes are rising. Uh, protein consumption rises. Yes, uh, pepper is directly correlated to protein consumption. Uh, uh, preference for natural color and taste in the developed world is coming up. Preference to use natural ingredients, nutraceuticals, healthcare, skincare, etc., uh, is growing at a rate much higher than the uh, consumption just because of the food category. Factors that could undermine the growth rate of demand. One must consider this in the new normal now. uh while everybody expected that okay you are going to stay at home during the covid uh, one very interesting fact is that globally the birth rates post covid have been dropping and this drop in birth rates in the short term may not be of very big significance but in the long term 10 15 years from now this is going to change the dynamic where uh, the which will impact demand of pepper consumption Uh, of course, inflation uh, is again a part of the new normal. Fertilizers getting expensive, uh, labor costs are getting expensive. Cost of farming has increased significantly in last few years. Land prices have gone above the roof, and then changing in eating habits are also happening. Uh, maybe perhaps people are going or they wanting to go to restaurant, but they can do away with still eating at home because you know what happened for the last few years. So there could be change in eating habits happening. Which may also impact uh, uh, demand uh, for pepper. Quickly, the last slide. Now, forces acting on the prices in two zero two two. As I said, we cannot give a guidance on whether it will go up or go down. That is not what we can tell the participants or attendees. But what we can tell is what is happening around, which may perhaps help you to make uh, uh, certain decisions and uh, trade accordingly. now there is enough uh, downward pressure and what is the downward pressure the uh, it is expected that the global interest rates may increase as the fed uh, withdraws on its uh, program of buying bonds and uh, they start raising interest rates because of high inflation uh, a lot of money may get uh, you know uh, filtered out from the system which will reduce the roi uh, on speculation once interest rates rises again this is a possibility see the demand may normalize after the spike in 2021 what happened in 2020 and 2021 is uh, as the pandemic hit as a consumer you go to a retail mall and you buy what you were going to buy for one week you buy for three months four months suddenly all the shelves are empty and the purchasing managers realize you know that uh, not more stock is coming because the ships are getting delayed and there is you know a double stock out situation once there is the inventory has ended in the pipeline and whatever has been ordered is going to be delayed and the prices were luckily very low so most of them just went wrong and they just bought a lot of pepper so there could be a lot of pepper lying around in destination uh, where uh, they bought more in the previous year large importing countries such as pakistan turkey iran etc due to inflation and due to other uh, pressures they see their currencies depreciate by over 30% now once your currency depreciates by 30% the cost of import just rises If you were buying a container of paper for you know seventy thousand dollars, now it is going to cost two hundred thousand dollars. That limits the ability of uh, stockists or wholesalers to stock produce uh, and trade because they require large amount of working capital now. Uh, uh, large importing countries such as uh, uh, I just said uncertainty on freight continues and inability to enter forward contracts leads to spot trade. so the exporters on the other hand in the origin now uh, are not freely or willingly giving uh, forward contracts which they were doing previously and the trade has moved into a spot trade 
So the farmers cannot squeeze the exporters in the sense that, okay, if somebody short, then he does panic buying, but right now there is no need for panic buying. At the same time, there is equally good argument for upward pressure. Global supply growth continues to be in negative territory, slightly reducing every year. Uh, no new plantations in Vietnam as lion prices have risen. Uh, perhaps in Brazil, the plantations continue. Uh, then there are climate change aspects of El Nino, La Nina, drought, too much rainfall, spatial distribution of rain is not good enough, and that is causing uh, uneven spiking of berries, etc. Uh, global demand continues to grow moderately, uh, growing um, in terms of consumption. Uh, sentiment amongst growers continues to be bullish than bearish. Increased cost of farming due to rising fertilizer and labor costs, increased freight rates, and rising domestic demand in China and India. So there is equal enough or good argument for upward pressure on prices as well. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, would like to wrap up uh, my presentation and I would like to invite uh, the executive director to please present on the uh, challenges, issues, the opportunities and way forward for the pepper industry. Thank you. Thanks, Jasvinder. Okay, um, I think we have to listen to presentation by Ra Mr. Rao. Laura and also Jeff Winder. We have shared the same views, uh, same insight. Just uh, let me uh, speak about the global pepper industry as a whole. So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'll be speaking about the current scenario, uh, IPC in brief, global paper production, trade and paper, this one, uh, trade and price, this one also has been shared by Jasmine there just now, and also I'll be, I'll be talking about issues and challenges, the COVID-19, inflation, disruption, in logistics, stringent regulations, and climate change, and also opportunities, IPC farmers app, research and development, smart farming, market expansion, and last uh, will be on the future strategic direction of the paper industry. Uh, which uh, I'll be speaking about the pepper price stabilization, traceability for our strategic collaboration and uh, more. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the first one will be the, I'll, I'll just uh, to make you familiar about our organization, uh, IPC in brief. Uh, just uh, for information, it was established in 1972 under the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. UNSCAP and the HQ is based in Jakarta, Indonesia. So our main functions is uh, our research on technical and economic aspect of pepper production, exchange of information on programs and policies relating to pepper production, promotional programs, especially to increase the consumption of pepper, um, statistical and other information, activities and functions that may be considered desirable in the, trade, in the interest of the uh, world pepper economy. So our key programs and activities are research and development, of course, and then our quality marketing, and then we have IPC awards, capacity building, crop survey, focus on pepper price alert, and we also have annual IPC conference, uh, HOD meeting and whatnot, and then our publication will be a daily price alert. You know, we do SMS uh, price alert to all our um, subscribers and then we have weekly price bulletin as well, monthly market review, quarter report, annual report, statistical yearbook and uh, special issues and many more. At the moment, we have uh, five uh, IPC member countries uh, which are India, Indonesia, um, Malaysia, Malaysia, and then we have Sri Lanka and Vietnam, and also we have two associate members uh, currently, uh, which are Papua New Guinea and the Philippines. And what's new uh, with IPC, uh, this year marks our 50th anniversary of our establishment of the IPC, and also celebration of the International Pepper Day on 16 April, our establishment date. And then we also have IPC Farmers App, and then crop report analytics, uh, rejection reports, direct country regulations. Right, next slide, please. So uh, just let, uh, just, uh, I'll give it, uh, more attention on the pepper industry for 2020 and 2021. Uh, this one also has been highlight, highlighted by Jess Winder just now in uh, her, his presentation. So for production in 2022, the total was uh, 582 to 31 uh, compared to 2021, uh, 531,580, which 9% uh, uh, 
uh, decrease and then we have consumption uh, for 2020 uh, 208 456 and then uh, uh, in 2021 we have uh, 215,654 tonnes uh, which is increase of uh, 3% for consumption. And for the excess and deficit, uh, uh, decrease of 15%, yeah? 373, uh, 865,000 in 2020, and 315,926 uh, in 2021. For pepper price, uh, to, from 2000 to 2021, the oversupply of pepper and low consumption of pepper have become the major reasons of the declining trend, if we can see from the, the, the graph. And uh, for global pe pepper production, uh, overall for 2021, the total production is uh, 535,713 uh, tons, uh, which is Vietnam was the highest, I mean, the, the largest producer of the uh, pepper, world pepper, uh, with 180,000 tons, followed by Brazil, Indonesia, India, Malaysia, China, and the last one would be this. All right. For issues and challenges, we have uh, this one has been mentioned also by uh, Mr. Rao and Just Binder, sustainability of the pepper industry due to COVID-19 pandemic, instability of the pepper price, stringent rules and regulations for pepper export, and of course, high cost of logistics. I'll be sharing the more issues and cha challenges in the next slides. Okay. So for global pepper production, the global pepper production in 2021 was uh, 537 KMT and is ex expected to be similar or slightly reduced in 2022. So the highest uh, uh, producer was Vietnam and uh, followed by Brazil, Indonesia, uh, India, Malaysia and Sri Lanka. And 30% from world total production was uh, 34% and Brazil 18% and 15% respectively uh, by Indonesia. So next slide. For global pepper export, the global pepper export by origin countries in 2021 was 464 KMT. As you, if you can see from the, the, the chart, global pepper export, uh, Vietnam still the highest, the largest pepper pro exporter with 57% from world total export by origins followed by Brazil and Indonesia with 20% and 8% respectively. For global pepper price, the global pepper price in 2021 was showing an increasing trend. If you can see from the, the chart, the composite price of pepper as of December was uh, US dollar 4,569 per metric ton for black pepper and US dollar 6,363 per metric ton for white pepper. That's recording an staggering increase of 50% and 40% when compared to the same period in 2022. All right. Okay. For issues and challenges in the pepper industry, next slide, please. Uh, number one, of course, the ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic travel is slowly being opened in the growing countries and it's expected that in later part of 2022, things will be will back to normal. Domestic lockdowns are easy in origins, allowing activities such as farm, extension, service, and etc. Country, uh, you can see from the slight countries growing pepper affected by COVID-19, India, 40 million, Brazil, 30 million, Indonesia, Vietnam, Sri, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia are in the vicinity of 5 million. The second uh, issues and challenges for the pepper industry, of course, pepper costs uh, push inflation and instability of pepper price. Cost of pepper farming increases significantly due to global inflation, high production versus low demand, and vice versa are impacting the, the whole global pepper price. And uh, of course, disruption in logistics, number three, port congestion, congestions continue. Frights are up to six times as compared to the pre-COVID era. And one can expect marginal softening in 2022. And the next uh, issues and challenges for the pepper industry, stringent rules and regulations for pepper export. Uh, we have listened to Laura's presentation on the the new regulations for pepper trade to USA and then uh, pesticide regulations continue to tighten not only in the Europe but in the most uh, other regions such as USA, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, South Korea, Taiwan and uh, etc. And of course uh, climate change, we are talking about climate change right now, climate change right now causing 
special disruption even in normal monsoon, widening difference between low and high temperatures are expanding stress in pepper farming and of course impacting, impacting pepper yield adversely. Right, next slide please. For pepper industry opportunities, uh, we'll be talking about the uh, IPC Farmers App. We have actually established the IPC Farmers App for the last for the past two years. Uh, we would like to create awareness for pepper smallholders on the importance and the benefits of using the app in pepper family farming in order to produce premium quality of pepper. And of course, we, uh, the other opportunities are marketing and promotion to boost marketing and promotion of the pepper industry in order to create more demand, which will help to increase the pepper price. And also, we'll be talking about smart farming, technical augmentation, vertical integration, and enhancing crop survey, enhancement of crop survey, crop survey activity is being conducted by utilizing GPS or geotagging based on geotagging. And of course, we have R&D and enhancements, development of pepper of non-food products, for example, cosmetics, skincare, pharmaceutical, and more. And last but not least, pepper consumption with the increasing of world population and also protein consumption, pepper will become one of the key ingredients in daily life, including cooking uh, and more. Next, like this. And this uh, will be our way forward for uh, future strategic direction for the pepper industry. Uh, we'll be studying more on the price, uh, pepper price stabilization mechanism. mechanism. You know, we have to identify appropriate mechanism, including measures to restrict exports similar to the agreed export tonnage scheme uh, as implemented by the International uh, Tripartite Rubber Council member countries. And we also will help to identify minimum export price for a certain grade of pepper and for IR and farm expansion, uh, for instance, blockchain technology, IoT, to communicate, convince catapult pepper smallholders on pesticide management and risk management on the weather for pepper sustainability. And of course, uh, the three the, the, the three main pillars for sustainability of the pepper industry and also the creative economies, innovation, adaptation, and collaboration. So strategic collaboration is one of the key important key components of uh, the creative economy to enhance strategic collaboration with other international organizations related to pepper to bring pepper industry to greater heights. I mean, for post-COVID recovery strategy. And for data visibility, all IPC countries have been requested to improve visibility on the data at FarmGet and then also we will uh, uh, enhance more on IPC activities, the implementation of uh, quality marketing and R&D within the community through our a series of webinar and more. And of course, we'll be talking about traceability, key technology and paper supply chain that con connects to the two ends of producer and buyer and thus helps build trust at two levels between producer and producer pro procedure. Uh, and between retailer and consumer of the pepper industry. And uh, I totally agree with what Mr. Rao saying, no pandemic or pandemic, the things have to, to change, yeah? The next, um, yeah, uh, uh, I've mentioned this one earlier, since uh, IPC will be celebrating its 50th anniversary of its establishment, uh, we have... Uh, a uh, few activities and programs uh, to be celebrated as well. And uh, just to inform you that we will be having a logo and photographic competition and we would like to invite all, uh, all of you to participate. And for more details, you can check uh, our website and please uh, support and participate to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the IPC. All right, and uh, that's all. Thank you very much. And I think I'll, I'll be sharing the global market scenario production. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, just render. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, there is a uh, usually we do a panel discussion before yeah. adopting numbers because the industry has a different view, in my opinion, and there right. are several questions coming up. So okay. uh, I would also invite Mr. Rao and if Ms. Laura, Laura. Can, if they are there, you know, we, there are some questions. And then we could uh, email these uh, numbers uh, later to everyone. 
So there were uh, there was a question um, which was again related to chlorpyrifos, and uh, as uh, Laura has already mentioned that as such nothing has changed uh, with regards to black pepper, but there are still exporters who are asking this question that how do we handle it? So one final comment, you know, from you, you know, will help them to you know come at peace because there has been too much of marketing. on this aspect and too many emails uh, being said uh, and the fact remains that you explained that you know nothing has changed i mean you were to comply before you have to comply now so uh, you know just few comments if you could you know uh. absolutely yeah so i think that it would be extremely important for our industry to move away from the use of chlorpyrifos on black pepper the entire world seems to be taking strides away from this chemical the european union has banned it the united states has banned it and many other nations around the world are banning the use of this chemical so the time is now for us to work as an industry to stop using chlorpyrifos as it relates to the ban in the united states i do not suddenly expect to see the majority of black pepper being imported into the united states will be tested by our government and that there will be immediately a huge regulatory challenge with it i think there is some of a leeway some of a period of time for us to be able to come into compliance with the requirements but you can expect to hear from your customers you can expect to hear from your customers that they want to understand what you're doing in your supply chain to make sure that it is free from chlorpyrifos they may be requiring testing as well so well i do not expect to see significant governmental enforcement in the short term now is the time to start moving away from the use of the chemical and be prepared that you will receive questions from your customers about this uh thank you very much uh so you heard her that you know uh, the elephant is there in the room it is uh, up to you you know you have to align and i think the best way would be to talk more to your customers because customers uh, who are importing in the us are best placed uh, to tell you what has to be done uh, i understand there are going to be costs of testing there are going to be costs of segregation and it has to be a uh, one to one discussion for now and in the long term we have to move away from it uh sir uh, there was one question um, on how uh, or how is uh, griffith or how can one um, help farmers or tell farmers to tackle with climate change because climate change is becoming a reality uh today we see the uh, north of vietnam uh is practically witnessing a cold wave uh today temperatures in hanoi have dropped close to 7 degrees uh where cassia is growing up north temperatures are below 5 degrees and you know metabolism of our tropical trees stops below 10 degrees a lot of stress is generated on the other side when you see higher temperatures when they go beyond 35 degree 37 degree uh we see temperature stress also happening now these are things which uh farmers cannot uh do an intervention themselves as such or are there any things that they can do uh, uh which you know can help them at least you know uh, uh take care that their crops are not affected by uh, climate change right uh, am i audible yes yes okay uh actually uh, this question uh, i can answer uh, because it's a question the scope of this question is very large so first of all let's look at it uh, from a global point of view uh, in a typical uh, uh, you know uh, plate uh, of a meal which is consumed uh, you know uh, pepper or other spices the contribution of those very very small so the real issue uh, comes uh, so far as climate change uh it comes on other food products mainly the meat uh, especially beef 
supposed to be the highest contributor. So the, the focus should be on those uh, industries, uh, so far as agricultural uh, raw materials are concerned. Uh, if, if you look at, if you arrange the emissions from the production of various food products, spices and herbs would be somewhere at the uh, lower end. And uh, big contributors, like I said, would be the meat industry, uh, followed by many other uh, production systems which are highly mechanized and which use uh, huge amounts of uh, uh, you know, uh, chemicals and uh, uh, fertilizers. So far, uh, but that is from a global point of view. Uh, as, however, as uh, members of this industry, we also have a responsibility to see what, what best we can do in the uh, spices and herbs that we source. If you consider the supply chain of a typical spice, uh, you will find that agriculture contributes to about 40-45% of the overall emissions of greenhouse gases that is there in the supply chain. So if you take um, right from the farm all the way up to the consumer, uh, I, 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 I'm not saying the consumer, but at least the final processor, you will see that um, agriculture's contribution is about 40%. And among that 40%, uh, the uh, highest contributor of almost 80% of that 40-45% 40, 40, comes from application of nitrogenous fertilizers. So uh, as a company, we should uh, uh, support uh, farmers in reducing the application of nitrogenous fertilizers. So this is uh, from a very, very uh, tactical point of view. However, as a strategy, what we all need to do First, first step in controlling this problem is measuring. And there are a number of protocols available which can be applied and number of good consultants who are experienced in this. And with the help of uh, their uh, expertise, uh, you, we can measure uh, the emissions at various stages of the supply chain, uh, like uh, growing, warehousing, manufacturing, shipments, in all these components, how much of greenhouse gas is being generated? And you, you can follow the 80-20 rule, identify which components are high, and then have plans uh, to tackle them. How do you tackle them? Uh, it, uh, because we are talking about agricultural emission, we have to uh, provide training to the farmer, provide incentives to the farmers for uh, uh, you know, taking the positive steps support them uh, wherever they need uh, credit for buying these uh, uh, you know, uh, more eco-friendly inputs and so on and so forth. And uh, once this is done, I'm sure we will be able to uh, do our bit in this uh, uh, fight against uh, global warming. Right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, quickly, uh, you know, some small things which farmers can do because we are also very active into the uh, farming process and uh, we work with several companies such as yours also. Uh, see, when, when it is getting very hot uh, in the summer months, essentially when we talk about sustainability, we are saying that do intercropping. Don't use uh, cement poles or dead poles. Try to use live uh, poles or live trees. By doing that, you would be giving good shade to your pepper plants when the temperatures soar. When the temperature soar, if you are not having, uh, say, a uh, natural uh, rain-fed area, try to use as much as irrigation as possible. Yes, uh, water costs, power costs, but by doing that additional expenditure, you would save your crop and save the yields uh, by a large uh, uh, factor. So you, you, you have to, we've seen in Vietnam in the years of drought, Vietnam is still able to produce because Vietnamese farmers actively do irrigation and put enough water in those dry months. So keep your uh, farms irrigated. Uh, in, in the high uh, rainfall months, I think drainage is very important. When the prices of pepper fall down, farmers do not look at gardening. They allow weeds to grow, that stops drainage. So along the sides of the trees, you know, it should be well drained. And on the or near the poles, allow the different cropping or weeds to grow, which keeps the temperature also down. So there are several small, small things that the farmers can do 
uh, to you know fight against climate change of course they have to look at a model farm or what we should propagate that okay uh, we must try to bring farmers uh, and demonstrate to them model farms which are part of sustainability activity and see how those farmers are able to keep their farms still doing well in the face of climate change also because we have seen in vietnam some farms are doing really excellent they also faced the same heat they faced the same erratic rainfall but they are able to generate good yield because those farmers were active and they took certain steps now the farmers who could not take steps perhaps they were not informed or they did not know uh, what has to be done so maybe information needs to be uh, propagated over there so and as mr rao said you know we have to work together as an industry to look at fertilizer to look at natural ingredients and whatever we can do as a small part for the pepper industry you know to help them to uh, yes it's a larger question i mean whatever happens uh, one cannot uh, change or just the pepper industry cannot change climate change as such it's going to be the uh, larger uh, base or uh, globally it has to uh, take place but we can add in a uh, small bit uh, there was a question uh, on um, uh, when uh, you know uh, from brazil that uh, there is enough and good demand uh, which is uh, rising and uh, for this uh, uh, do or does the panel think that brazil is really placed well or positioned to capture that demand so uh, sir would you like to throw some light or i'll take this yeah like uh, uh, you also said uh, we find that brazil uh, is a good has done a lot of improvement in the way they process uh, i mean they grow the pepper a uh, lot of work a uh, lot of uh, increase in the acreage and a lot of good farmers uh, who have replaced their coffee plantations with pepper uh, however the biggest challenges we as a buyer you know because uh, almost 60% of what we consume is in the us and we have tried uh, in the past to source from uh, brazil so we we face uh, uh, two problems uh, the first one is that uh, there the, there is no processing uh, capability in brazil to meet the uh, global food safety and quality standards including uh, not sufficient seam sterilization capacity uh, and so on and so forth which makes it it very difficult for a, a you know a company who is based in the consuming country to actually import directly from brazil secondly also the weather and the drying practices also we feel that there is a little bit of risk in the way drying is done by using you know uh, the mechanical drying where they use the uh, burn the nuts you know i think the macadonia nuts or whatever nuts we we feel that there is a contamination of ph as well as some kind of allergen also could get so sun drying sun dried brazil pepper is very good uh, we don't have any risks so these are the two challenges uh, which we face if brazil can address these uh, issues uh, if the industry in brazil can come together and with the cooperation of buyers we we would also be more than happy to contribute which if these things are addressed then definitely brazil can uh, become value added exporters to the uh, developed country right so uh, finally there was a question on will uh, the pepper price increase as i said in the beginning you know we cannot give guidance uh, uh, we have just explained to you the forces acting on uh, the prices of pepper and uh, it is dynamic uh, also we presented and some hints have been given that yes the uh, pepper prices need to go slightly higher to allow, allow the farmers to start planting again and uh, this may happen this may happen this year this may happen next year because if the prices rise it helps the entire industry uh, uh, or at least the growing industry to make pepper farming slightly more sustainable of course we do not want prices to be too low which makes pepper farming unsustainable we do not want pepper prices to be too high which creates problem at the demand end because consumers uh well consumers may not have a direct impact you know uh, immediately but in the long term uh the industry feels the impact and uh, once the industry starts feeling the impact 
then then they start changing recipes you know then they start looking at innovative ways that uh, can they reduce the pepper in the part of the recipe and replace it by some other spice or do other things uh, so on one on the other third front we are having innovative uses of uh, pepper uh, you know uh, pepper oil is helping people reduce smoking also uh there are companies advertising pepper oil uh, which support them to uh, reduce their uh, smoking addiction so there are very innovative uses of pepper coming up and demand is growing and uh, certainly uh, there is a bright future uh, what is missing is uh, i believe a, a lot of communication with the growing community uh, uh when we do our surveys in vietnam we find uh, 90% of our farmers uh are still you know uh, in a category where they could they would struggle to get this information from an international level and that is where the domestic organizations whether it is vpa or uh, the exporters organization in indonesia or the brazilian exporters or individual companies who are working with the farmers it becomes their responsibility to disseminate more information uh, to the farmers and train them if if all the uh buyers of pepper and exporters come together and even you know decide that i want to train 100 or 200 farmers i think we will be able to cover a significant uh portion of the farming community uh for the betterment of the entire uh, trade so uh you please have your own guesses of the pepper price and we cannot comment uh there was another one question on uh, what is the new normal uh by this we essentially meant is that yes we uh, are behind the, the pandemic is behind us in in a larger sense the new normal essentially means that we did not have such high freights before and now we have high freights and maybe they will reduce but they will still remain because shipping lines have now learned how to uh, you know uh, come together as a group and charge customers and for their benefit uh, good for them uh so i don't see personally my view is that rates won't suddenly crash to uh pre pandemic levels inflation is here to stay it is not going to suddenly change suddenly fertilizer fertilizer prices are not going to fall by 50% uh which they were before the pandemic suddenly labor costs are not going to reduce today it is you know farmers are struggling pepper berries are drying and becoming red but they don't find labor to uh, uh pluck the berries so these are the challenges uh which were uh, or which have come up after uh, last two years of uh, stress and the new normal also here is you know the consumer behavior is also changing e-commerce has got an enormous amount of um uh, raise over here and as uh, people go on to internet more and they get more informed consumers become more uh, sharp and uh, they make industries to align so uh, that is the new normal we are talking about of course uh, uh, these are the factors which have come into play in the last two years that is what we meant by the theme uh, there is no uh, other question just that um, as i said in the beginning uh, certain uh, attendees have raised this concern that the numbers perhaps that were shown were underballed uh, what i am again trying to explain is that uh we are going to revisit those numbers we are not publishing those numbers in a big way we made a presentation uh there was not enough time to were doing a survey of you know because lockdowns were there etc we are going to talk to all the uh, government agencies again and uh, we are going to revisit them and then we will you know maybe uh, come out and publish it so there is no hurry uh, and what we must look at is the difference you know it, it, that is what uh, we were trying to explain and that is what matters the most because we are looking at a year to year base may change if the base was changed it was changed for the previous year also and changed for this year also so we are we are supposed to perhaps look at the difference that has happened uh from number to number so i i i see a lot of comments and uh, people saying that you know that perhaps uh, uh, what vietnam is saying of uh, 162000 tons is um, way below it would be somewhere close to 180 190 or 200 whatever but yes i mean uh, nothing stops uh, the industry to uh, uh, you know assume their own numbers or make their own estimates uh, one must understand if this this year's number was reduced so was last year's number reduced so carry forward plus crop together put together there is enough availability is what they were hinting at and um, so i would like to end uh, uh, the uh, panel discussion uh, to that 
and I would like to hand over to uh, the director again uh, for a vote of thanks and uh, closing the session. Over to you, madam. So sorry. <laughs> okay, um, just been there. I will just uh, show the. We will just uh, show the uh, global scenario just now. Market scenario. The of course the the data uh, is still not uh, confirmed yet because we will be receiving uh, changes from member countries still. But we will just uh, publish it just to inform all the participants. Um, I just want to bring your attention to the uh, the, the numbers, figures highlighted, uh, which are the for IPC uh, countries for black uh, and white pepper. You can see from the figures of it. Uh, but well, this one is not actual yet. But we will discuss it later again uh, once we receive the the numbers from the countries here. Yeah? And on, on that note, uh, I would like to thank all the uh, participants and of course our distinguished uh, speakers uh, for having uh, spent time from your busy schedule to uh, join us for today's webinar. We hope that uh, you you get information and insights from all the presentation just now and uh, thank you very much and I hope uh, we hope that we will be having a more series of webinar this year uh, inshallah and maybe in June and also September and with that uh, I thank uh, everyone and good night from uh, Jakarta and thank you very much thank you and good night thank everyone thank you thank you very much thank you very much Bye-bye. Take care and stay safe, yeah? Thank you. Thank you.